Hello everybody, Peter Greenberg here with our global travel update. Happy October 16th, wherever you happen to be. Uh, these are strange and interesting times and very sad times as well. If you're a traveler, if you're a human being. So first let's do our update from what's going on in the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, the death toll, as you can imagine, is well over 3,000, probably closer to 4,000 as I'm speaking and about to get worse if uh, announcements or any indication from both sides. Our hearts and our prayers go out to the innocent victims on both sides of this terrible tragedy um, as uh, things are ramping up. And of course, the global impact that it's having on travel literally uh, around the world uh, and particular to the Israeli area. Uh, airspace, of course, is relatively restricted into Tel Aviv. Uh, in the region, there are still some flights getting into Oman, uh, into Egypt, of course, into Cairo, into uh, regional uh, airports that are usually hubs for, uh, for the Middle East, like Cyprus, and of course, into Cairo, uh, excuse me, into Athens. Um, however, uh, getting in is not easy, getting out is not easy. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of a, of, a, of a very interesting story about uh, some folks who wanted to get in. And there was a flight on El Al coming into Tel Aviv. Uh, it was fully loaded, but so many people wanted to come back and volunteer uh, that upon boarding, uh, they can, they continue, the captain made the determination that weight was not an issue, and they continued to board people. They took all the available seats on the plane, and then uh, the pilot said, you know what, uh, let's board more people and put them in the crew rest seats. And then the captain gave more permission to people who wanted to go back and enlist, and there were people sitting on the floor, sleeping on the floor. Uh, the last time I heard about a plane where they exceeded the official safety rules in terms of passenger capacity was back in 1975. In fact, that flight holds the record for the most number of people ever carried on a 747. It was a Qantas 747 after the terrible hurricane in Darwin in northeastern Australia. And I believe they left the ground with, I, I, I may have my numbers wrong, but close to 600 people on a 747 that was designed to, I think, carry 440. Uh, remember, it's not about the people crammed in there. It's about the total weight of the plane, and they didn't have a lot of cargo. They were just getting people out, and they were able to do it. So they did this on the um, on the LL plane into Tel Aviv, where people wanted to go back and uh, and enlist. Uh, there's some other side effects here that we want to talk about uh, from this. Uh, the airspace, of course, closing as we speak, uh, and of course the State Department trying to get Americans and their um, and their relatives out and their families. Uh, in addition, there's some other stuff that was triggered by this. You know, we talked about on our show before the long, outrageous waits for foreigners to get visas to the United States, sometimes taking over a year and a half. Well, those wait times are now going to increase because we're basically turning off the, uh, turning off the valve, if they, if, as they say. We're concentrating now on basically security. Uh, security airports... Uh, whether you're, fly I'm not talking about whether you're flying to Israel. Security at airports, if you're flying, is going to be increased. It's going to be ramped up, especially what they call the high-risk, high-profile flights back to the United States. Not flights from the United States as much as flights back to the U.S. And you'll see that at airports like Heathrow and Charles de Gaulle and Rome and, uh, and other countries in Europe uh, where there have been, you know, some incidents in the past. Uh You'll see increased secondary and tertiary screening and, um, and inspections, uh, so be careful of that. Cruise lines, of course, have already pulled out of port stops in Haifa, but they're not stopping there. They're rearranging their cruise stops so that they're not stopping anymore in Saudi Arabia. They're not stopping anymore in a lot of the eastern Mediterranean cities along the coast. So if you have a cruise planned, uh, be aware of that. Keep in mind that cruise lines have always had the right to substitute ports in the event of a, what they would call an act of war, a force majeure, an act of God. This certainly qualifies us to two of those three. And uh, so be prepared for that. Uh, the other real, you know, collateral damage business-wise is in tour operators. They can't get insurance in the region, so they've stopped operating. 
Uh, they've canceled. If not, passengers are already canceling on their end. The real challenge now is how many of them are capitalized well enough to give refunds, not future trip credits or vouchers, actual refunds. If you paid for a trip with a credit card um, and they're offering you a voucher or a future credit, unless you have personal knowledge as to the financial health of that tour operator, please contact your credit card company and dispute the bill. You need to get your money back on this because the, the impact of the, the, these terrible events in Israel and the region are not going to be resolved uh, anytime soon, at least in terms of trip planning. I can tell you that. Uh, we're talking at least a year out. And what's particularly devastating economically is so many of these countries in that region, Egypt, Jordan, and, and especially Israel, depend so much uh, on travel and tourism for their GDP. And it just evaporated overnight. Uh, that's what this incident has done. And it's not going to get any better anytime soon. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any of your questions about that as we continue. But now let's shift gears and talk about some other items in the news. Uh, the fallout continues. The blowback continues from the Delta Airlines attempt to change their frequent flyer programs and their uh, credit card usage for their lounges. Uh, we're seeing this, uh, especially in, in the credit card area, where so many members of the American Express card are either threatening to or they have actually cut their cards up. Uh, they don't see the value in it anymore. Many of them are going to a cash back card especially in light of Delta's requirement that if you want the lowest tier membership based on your consumer credit card spend, you have to spend at least $75,000 on your co-branded American Express card. And that's for the lowest tier, which gets you these perks. Zero. So let's do the math. If you get a 2% cash back card and dump the American Express card, guess what? That's $1,500. As a, when you spend 75000 that's money in your pocket, not miles you can't redeem or lounge access you can't have. So a lot of people have been able to connect the dots and do the math, and that fallout continues. In fact, some of the airlines involved, I mean, tangentially, are using this. They're seizing upon it as an opportunity, but the challenge for them, of course, is to deliver the promise that they're making. Uh, Alaska Airlines and JetBlue are offering status match to Delta Frequent Flyers. Whatever, you have, whatever status you have on Delta, they will match it on Alaska or JetBlue. And at the high tier level, that means you're immediately a, a member of their Mosaic program at JetBlue, which is great. But remember, it's a capacity issue. They only have so many Mosaic seats on the plane. Uh, and what JetBlue is now starting to do is going to different tiers of the Mosaic problem. And you might find yourself right back where you started at Delta because they certainly can't handle the numbers. It's crazy. They've oversold the perks. They've oversold the upgrades. They've oversold the memberships. And at the same time, they've all gone to a fare-based program, which means they're still selling the program, meaning it's not based on how many flights you take or how many miles you fly. That's why these programs were started. We used to go, we were chasing miles for the last 42 years, and now everybody got slapped in the face by one airline after another, it was started by Americans, saying, oh, we're going to a fare-based program, so now it doesn't matter how many flights you take or how many miles you fly, it's based on how much you spend. And uh, to a lot of people, that was a major insult after all these years of depending on them to keep their promise. We'll have more on that in the days and weeks ahead because that story is going nowhere right now. Uh, but continuing. It's not going away. It's continuing. Uh, now, the other thing is we're seeing some reciprocity issues that predated the incident in Israel. Uh you, we all know about the, the new visa requirement for European Union countries starting in January. You're going to have to get an electronic visa. Brazil just reinstated visa requirements for travelers from the U.S. It means you've got to get a physical visa, um, and, uh, and a visitor visa is going to cost you. And you got to go get one. It's a physical document now, which uh, people up until now, we were happy they didn't have to do it. Now you do. Uh, another reason why... Even though passport stamps are going away, in many cases, from our passports, from foreign countries, a visa takes up a whole page. So if you're looking to get a new passport, and I encourage you to do that now, or even a renewal if you have less than six months of validity left, don't get the 28-pager. 
get the 52-pager, because remember, a passport's good for 10 years. So many people, friends of mine, said, oh, but I don't travel that much. And six years later, they go, oh, I got to get a new passport. Because in the old days, you could go to any U.S. consulate or passport office, and they would actually insert pages, additional pages into your passport for no additional cost. Those days are, are over. If you exceed your pages, you got to get a new passport. So I'm just letting you know, you have a choice when you apply for one, get the 52-pager. Okay. I uh, want to talk about something that I was going to talk about anyway this week, uh, and that's over-tourism. You know, seasonality is gone in travel these days. People are traveling 12 months a year. It's no longer an, an idea of where are you going next year. It's like, where are you going to be next week? I want to show you a picture first, and I'll put it in context, uh, of me going down the famous gorge in Petra on camel with a uh, favorite companion of mine. This was done when we shot the, uh, the television special, The Royal Tour of Jordan. On the left-hand side of the picture, you see uh, the King of Jordan. On the right-hand side, you see a much heavier me. <laughs> the camels were getting combat pay for that one. Uh, that's what that was like in the year 2021. Now I'm going to show you the same gorge when, when a couple of cruise ships came into Petra, not to Petra, but to Aqaba in Jordan, and decided to visit Petra. Check a look at this video. That's a movie they're making called Indiana Jones and the Temple of Too Many People. No, actually, that was just recently taken uh, in the same gorge that we went down on camel, just the two of us. Granted, I had special access with the king, but even then, it was never as crowded as it is right now. Uh, so timing is everything. Uh, with all due respect to the cruise ships, wherever I'm going to a destination, I always want to know if it's Alaska, if it's St. Martin or St. Thomas, Nassau. How many ships will be in the harbor the day I'm there? If it's any more than one, I pick another day to go. Life's too short. You want to have a special moment with some of these amazing destinations. And a special moment is not my idea of what you just saw in the video. So I just thought I'd share it with you because I remember the picture I took with the king. And uh, Patricia Schultz is nice enough to send me that video. Uh, Patricia Schultz, of course, you know, is the author of A Thousand Things, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. She's amazing. Uh, and there, there are new editions of that book every year. Well worth it. But anyway, she sent me that video and I wanted to share it with you. All right, let's go down and say hello to a couple of people here. Vivian saying hello from uh, for Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Sue Hennepin is saying hello from Bellingham, Washington. Uh, Catherine saying thank you for this important update. I'm sorry I have to give you the update, but the, the situation is fluid. It's evolving very quickly. And in the short term, I don't think it's going to have a happy ending. Um, so be aware of what's going on. Situational awareness is everything. Uh, Diane says, I'm planning on going to Japan. What's the best month to go visit weather-wise and the best month to book a ticket? Well, Japan in the last year, speaking of over-tourism, has been overcrowded to the extreme. Very difficult even to get a hotel room. Uh, so if I were you, I'd go September, October, or March or April. Anytime after that, it gets even more crowded, okay? Now, if you ask them what's the best month to book a ticket, it, you want to go about 54 days out, uh, unless it's a holiday. So if you're looking for March or April, as long as it's not spring break or Easter, then you, you backdate those 54 days and watch it. Because remember, the airlines use very sophisticated algorithms these days to project year over year, day over day, month over month demand. It also allows them to try to realistically set prices based on that demand. And when you get to that 54-day mark, if those algorithms don't hold up, meaning those projections don't hold up, then the prices come down. That's why you pick that day. All right, let's keep going. Juice saying hi from Japan. Speaking of Japan, uh, okay, this is Armanda from Miami. We have a cruise book for late December to Dubai. Should we go or cancel? You go. Absolutely. 
Uh, Dubai is not in the line of fire, uh, never has been, uh, and, uh, and they understand travel and transportation very well. So my, my advice is go. But at the same time, situations can change between now and then. Read your contract of carriage carefully to find out what your rights are. Remember, if you want to cancel a flight right now, anywhere in the world, uh, and it's your idea, and, and, you're using, and you're using a U.S. airline, then you're not going to get your money back. You'll get a credit that goes into your account that you can apply to other flights. If the airline, on the other hand, cancels the flight for any reason, then you're entitled to immediate refund back to your original form of purchase. Those are long-standing DOT rules. So again, uh, I would say, Armando, go, plan on going, and then you can make another decision close to game time. But right now, I don't foresee any problems in Dubai. Uh, Colleen says, I happen to be in Paris. I noticed silently elevated security at the Venice airport, uh, but the flight from Zurich to Charles de Gaulle yesterday was almost empty. Went to Mass at Chapel of Our Lady of the Miraculous on Rue Bach this morning. If our Holy Mother was ever willing to create a miracle, now would be a really good time. I totally agree. Uh, the passenger loads are dropping. That's because Amer when things like this happen, not just Americans, but many people around the world tend to kind of, their body language changes and they want to stay home. Um, and they do stay home. They were prepared to do that anyway prior to the events in Israel, simply because they overspent so much money on travel up to September. And they were getting into their credit cards, which they're having difficulty paying. So a lot of people decided to take a breather for the last quarter of 2023 and ramp up again next year. Now, if you happen to be in a position where you've got some extra money lying around, keep in mind that airfares as of today are down, in, on average, about 31% over what they were in August. Pretty good deal. Hotel rates are starting to drop as well. So now's the time to, to, uh, to check it out, if you have time. And finances. Uh, okay, I heard ETIAS, that's the electronic visa for the, for the European Union, was pushed out to prevent issues with the Paris Olympics. I had not heard that, T. I will get back to you on that. I'll have an answer for everybody next week. But right now, it's not going to be, even if it wasn't, it doesn't kick in until January, so we have enough time to prepare. I'll get you that information. Anthony and my team has already made a note of it, and we'll get that for you next week. Uh, Camilla says, cheers from Malibu, then L.A., Palos Verdes Peninsula, then Carlsbad State Beach, Mission Beach, We're Lake Havasu State Park, Oatman, Ghost Town, Kingman, Seligman, that's Route 66, Sedona, and finally Tortilla Flat, Ghost Town in Arizona. I'm assuming you're driving. <laughs> All right, Camilla. Uh, hello to Gail from Pennsylvania. Pat says, uh, I thought I read recently that the EU visa was delayed another year. Okay, that's the second one of ours saying that. We'll definitely check that out before you get you that information. I hope they delay it entirely. It's it's just, it's it's reciprocity when you don't need it. Uh, our, go, our good friend Karen Ballard saying hi. All right. By the way, if you uh, if you watch the our show, our special, the uh, the Royal Tour of Tanzania, uh, and you see any of the photographs taken on that anywhere in the world, Karen's the one who shot them. Hello, Katrina from Alabama. Uh, Ju has a question about ETIS. I will get you that information. Oh, and Robert Landau. Now I know who's actually watching this stream. That picture of me and the king going down the gorge. Uh, and the credit was actually in that picture, Robert. It was taken by you, Robert Landau, in 2001. Nice to hear from you, Robert. Credit where credit's due. Uh, Lorena says, hello from Michigan. Before I went to Alaska, I went to the website that shows which ships were in port, how many people in their arrival and departure times. It was great. I wholeheartedly agree, and keep in mind there are some cruise ships now that are really getting smart. There's a new, a new ship line, a subsidiary of MSC called Explora or Explora Journeys. They have a new ship called the Explora One, and they are intentionally scheduling their arrival time to ports after the other ships leave, which means in many cases they'll get in around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they'll overnight in that port and not leave till the next night. That's cool way to see the country, or at least a better way to see the country. Uh, Gail says, I've decided to travel in the USA this year because of what you just showed. Too many people headed to Vegas in a couple weeks. Wait a second. There are too many people in Vegas, Gail. Have you, done, have you not noticed that? Las Vegas remains a perfect enigma to me. 
They continue to add hotel rooms in a state that has no water, by the way. And we're talking about hundreds and thousands of hotel rooms. And they keep filling them. Their entire business model has changed. They no longer make the majority of their money from gaming. That's the polite way of saying gambling. Uh, it's food and beverage and entertainment. Uh, something like 23 of the top 45 sommeliers in America are permanently based in Las Vegas. You also have every major star in residence there. The tickets are not inexpensive. Uh, and they're filling their casinos. Not necessarily with people playing blackjack, but with people enjoying amazing dinners and amazing entertainment. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens. We're going to actually be doing the show in a couple of weeks from Las Vegas, from the new Virgin Hotel in Las Vegas. There's an oxymoron, Virgin Las Vegas. But uh, that hotel used to be the Hard Rock, for those of you who remember. And we'll be broadcasting our radio show from there in a couple of weeks. Uh, Pamela's saying hello from Silverdale, Washington. Uh, ah, good evening from Kenya. Kenya's been a tourist destination of the world. Kindly share your experiences on the best tourist attraction sites in Kenya. What did you like about Masai Mara in Kenya? Well, I've been going to Kenya since, I shouldn't tell you, about 1984. So it's coming up on 40 years. Uh, I go back to the days when uh, the Maasai didn't have cell phones. <laughs> um, and that was a big difference. I go back to the days when you could still um, get silver service, actually silverware service on the uh, Nairobi to Mombasa Railroad, which went about, it was the old Uganda Railroad, which went about eight miles an hour. Uh, it's sort of like an out of Africa special. By the way, the railroad's still running. Uh, listen, I'm a big fan of Kenya, uh, not just the Maasai Mara, but Grace Mombasa. I love uh, uh, Lamu, and I love uh, the, uh, the, up the Mount Kenya area, of course. Uh, but remember, it's all about when you go and who's, who's guiding you, who's your storyteller. Um, my storyteller was an amazing man named Ambrose Gauchi, who sadly passed away about seven years ago. You could sit by the fire with him every night, and he would tell you a story that would mesmerize you about the culture, the people, the animals, the topography. He put everything in immediate context. And that's what you need when you travel to a place. It's not just looking around and saying, oh, look, there's a giraffe. It means nothing. I mean, it doesn't mean nothing. But it doesn't mean what it could mean without that proper context and perspective. So picking the right guide is the key. It's not just the right destination. I was just in Kenya back in June. I'll be going back again in a couple of weeks, as a matter of fact. Um, Okay. Uh, Raymond, my pal Raymond Bixton. Hello. Aloha from New Jersey. Aloha to you, Raymond, and also to Birgit. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Patty wants to know the best month for Athens and Istanbul. Guess what? It's the exact same two months. May and September, the two magic months. Um, Istanbul now, of course, I'll go at the drop of a hat. Uh, Athens, listen, the biggest problem with Athens, again, is over tourism. You know, there were 30,000 people a day this past summer in 100 plus degree weather walking up that hill to the Acropolis. People were passing out. And think of the numbers. It was crazy. So what did the Greek government do? Excuse me. They figured out this is the way we're going to solve the problem. We're going to limit the number of people going up to the Acropolis every day to 20,000. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. But that's one of the reasons why I only go in May and September. Uh, all right. Now, our good friend Captain Jonathan Atkin just finished completing the aerial photos for Crystal with the return of the Crystal Serenity. I was just on the Serenity, uh, Jonathan, with our good pal Manfredi. Manfredi, who owns Crystal. Manfredi used to own Silver Sea. He sold that to uh, Royal Caribbean in 2019, early 2020, and went out in bankruptcy of the Crystal Bankruptcy and bought their two ships, the Serenity and the Symphony, and he's also announced the building of four new ships. And I'm sure the Crystal, I mean, I was just on the Serenity. It's just as beautiful as it always has been, and uh, it has one of the most loyal passenger groups I've ever seen. 
If you want to talk about an emotional connection with a ship, it's remember I talked about storytellers in, in Africa? It's the emotional connection with the crew. The passengers on, on Serenity, when they announced they were coming back, they boarded the ship and they were crying. I watched it myself. I mean, it's amazing. There was um, a show that we did uh, for CBS a couple of years ago. I discovered this one woman who loved the ship so much and loved the crew so much, she moved there permanently. Her name was Mama Lee. And we caught up with her in Vancouver as the ship was about to do the, the Northwest Passage. Uh, they built her her own cabin, one for her, one for her wardrobe. She sold her house, she sold her car, she sold all of her material possessions other than clothing. And there she was, 24-7, 365. Once every so often when they had to put the ship in a, in a dry dock, they worked it out with another competing cruise line to come alongside the Serenity. And she transferred over there for like the six weeks the other ship was in the dry dock. And then she came right back again. When you have loyal passengers like that, there's a reason. And guess what? It's not the size of the cabin. It's not the size of the ballroom. It's not the, it's not the, you know, the menu that the chef provides. It's the crew. And uh, on, on, on Crystal and on Silver Sea, for that matter, those crew members are, I mean, amazing. Just amazing. Uh, Colin says, April in Japan is magical because of the Cherry Blossom Festival. You're right. But then again, it gets crowded. Um, okay. Sharon wants to know if there are Big Island volcano issues. Well, the Big Island of Hawaii always have a, always has a volcano issue, at least the last couple of decades, because it still erupts. It's probably erupting as I'm speaking right now. But it's not erupting in a way that is uh, life-threatening. In fact, the tours still go there. Uh, and uh, I would have no trouble going there today. Uh, Joan says, hello from California. Just got back from Paris, London, and the Cotswolds. And, uh, oh, came home sick. Sorry about that, Joan. But it was worth a month of a wonderful trip. Uh, ah, Patty says, my fave church in Paris. I prayed it. I prayed there, and it was answered. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Ellen, I think, is telling us that they've moved back the uh, European electronic visa, the ETIS, to May of 2025. It's no different than what we did in this country with Real ID. We kept kicking that can down the road, and nothing got changed. So uh, we'll believe it when we see it. I'll still have a confirmed answer for you by next week. But according to Ellen, it's May of 2025. We will believe it when we see it. Um, Denise says, making my longtime dream trip happen after a heart attack and stroke, I'm going to Australia. Planning to spend 30 days renting a small RV and still at times doing hotel. Is October the best month? Well, Denise, congratulations on your survival. Congratulations on your recovery. But I have to ask you a question. With all due respect, why would you drive on the wrong side of the road? That's enough to give me a heart attack. I want you to think about that. This is the time for you to get a car and a driver or even an RV and a driver and pamper yourself as opposed to negotiating roads on the wrong side of the, of the, of the highway. That's just uh, my thought. Now, October 2024 is one of the best months in most of Australia. Uh, you say 30 days. I have no idea how much ground you want to cover because they're getting into their spring at that point. Um, so it's a little cool at night. Be aware of that. And it can be a little rainy, but it will not be crowded. Okay. Donna wants to know, should we hop over to Curacao and Bonaire from Aruba? Well, you haven't told me the context of that, Donna. Are you sailing to, to, uh, to Aruba and have extra days, or are you flying to Aruba and just want to add to your trip? Let me know, and I'll try to answer that. Uh, okay. Evelyn wants to know, how did I miss a date change? What, for this today or for the European visa? The reason why we're talking to you today is I'm getting on a plane tonight uh, to do a shoot where I would not be available this week to talk to everybody. But we'll be back next week, either on Wednesday or Thursday, most likely Thursday, from a U.S. destination, and check your email or check your streaming services to find out exactly what time and, and where we're going to do it. But we're hoping that to stay on 12 noon Eastern time, for either next Wednesday or Thursday. Check your schedules on that. Uh, Peter, it seems like the prices of cruises are increasing. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, they are, with one notable exception, and those are the repositioning cruises. Some of you veteran cruisers know exactly what I'm talking about. At least twice a year, 
cruise ships have to be repositioned from the Mediterranean to Florida or from uh, the West Coast to South America it, or, or from the West Coast to, to Asia. And those are the best deals ever because they have to move the ship. doesn't matter who's on board, they have to move the ship. So we're seeing uh, there's a Princess Cruise from the West Coast to Sydney, and it'll stop in places like Tahiti. It's about 26 days, and the actual cost of the, of the ship starts at, per cabin, $46 a night. You can't wake up in Cleveland for $46 a night. That also includes your meals. So check that out. Go through a travel agent. Ask them which lines they represent and which lines have repositioning cruises. Some of these cruises are, are, are as much as 47 days. You know, there's one from Barcelona to Fort Lauderdale or from Barcelona to New Orleans. I think Car Carnival had that one. But the ships are maybe one-third full. You own it. Many days at sea, which I love. It's not just a cruise. It's a crossing. How cool is that? And you'll be good. And the price is right. Uh, okay. Well, greetings from Denver, Evelyn. Thank you for that. Ah. Uh, Gail says, I should have been clearer. We have relatives in Vegas, so we won't be among the unreal amount of crowds, especially with the new Sphere Theater. I'm going to go check out the new Sphere Theater in the next couple of weeks. It's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing audio and visual experience. But again, I don't care if you have relatives in Vegas or not. Good luck driving on the Strip. You'll be out there for hours, and you know it. Okay. Uh, Bonnie says, hi, it's Bonnie from Pennsylvania. Okay, Bonnie. Uh, oh, Gail said, if I've been in the new Sphere of Vegas, I will be there. Uh, next month. Uh, okay. Ah, Colleen says, if I were in the U.S. now, I'd be headed to Las Vegas on, well, 10, 12, 23 is last week, honey, uh, to attend the Literary Star Study Las Vegas Book Festival. Or you're talking about December 10th. It can't be October 12th. Let me know. All right. Uh, we love visiting Athens last October, Michelle says. Right, that's the time to go. Uh, okay, let's keep going here. Uh, Joan says, I just saw your article in Costco Connection regarding Austin and San Antonio. Uh, agree that both cities are the best ones in Texas and very different cities indeed. I love them both. Uh, and you know what they say, keep Austin weird. Uh, cruising to South America on Princess in December 23, any issues brewing that I should consider? None that I'm aware of. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, what I know, I don't know. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, now Camilla's telling me. it's it, I'm definitely driving three-week road trip, traveling in a rented F-150. That's that Ford pickup truck. And camping with a great view mostly overnight. Camilla, be sure to let, take pictures and let us know how it was. Speaking of pictures, let's do the photo of the week right now. Let's do it. Who is this? Oh, my goodness. Fran Sam said this. Uh, and where was this from? The Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Uh, it's elk rutting time at Rocky Mountain National Park. People line up their cars on the road of Moraine Park to watch the male elks screaming for the females. <laughs> okay. Uh, this reminds me of my incident with a moose in, in, uh, in Yellowstone. And the moose almost won. Let's just put it that way. If you ever had any thoughts that moose are slow-moving animals, you better think again. I was on a snowmobile traveling through uh, that part of Wyoming and Montana, and uh, way in the distance. It was the winter time. I had four layers of clothing on, thick gloves, my you know my stocking cap. I saw a moose. How did I see him? Because the steam coming out of his nose, and then he saw me, and he started moving towards me. And I figured, well, it's a moose. What? I'm on a snowmobile. And then he started picking up, literally picking up steam, and he was making a beeline right for me, and he was coming very fast. The only thing that saved me, the daredevil that I am, I had no choice, I revved up the snowmobile and drove it into a snowbank. And I was immediately covered by snow, and I could hear, up close and personal, his nostrils making noise. He was definitely trying to check me out. Then some other people came on the trail and he ran off. Don't ever try to outrun a moose. You will not win. Okay. Uh, okay, which month is best to visit Cape Town? Well, 
That's from Jew. Listen, I've been in Cape Town just about every month of the year. Uh, for me, again, Southern Hemisphere, again, September, May, or June. Uh, now, that's for us. But for them, no. For them, you reverse it, right? It's literally January, December, and maybe uh, March, which is there going into their fall. Okay? Ah, hello from Georgia, says Denise, planning my dream trip to Australia. Okay, I think we just did that for you. Uh, Tanzania is weighing in. Uh, Donna saying, flying to Aruba for two weeks. We've gone early December for 25 years and I've never hit the other two islands. Okay, so if you want to do those two islands, um, Curacao, uh, and, and I don't want to anger the Curacao people, but I've yet to be impressed by it. Is it worth a one-time visit? Absolutely. Um, but uh, Aruba, on the other hand, has really gotten their act together, especially when it comes to sustainability and, and protecting their resources. They are going to be, I think by next year, completely fossil fuel free on the island. Combination of wind and solar. Uh, it's amazing what they've done. Okay, let's keep going. Ah, Colleen corrected herself. It's this coming Saturday, not October 12th, October 21st, the Las Vegas Book Festival. Great idea. All right, so congratulations to Fran and her winning photograph. And if you got a, a photo that you think qualifies as the photo of the week, you know what to do. You send it to me, Peter at PeterGreenberg.com. And if we agree, we'll put it right on the air. All right, let's go to some of the questions you wrote in. Uh, oh, okay. When should tourists return to Maui from Mary? Well, I'll give you a qualified answer. Now, it's a qualified answer because you're not just going to go in a vacuum. You're going to pick up the phone. You're going to call the hotel you want to stay at. And you're going to ask them very important questions. Number one, can you accommodate me? Because many hotels are accommodating their own employees who lost everything. Number two, is there anything I can do to help? Why not get up close and personal when you're there? Uh, I'm not asking you to like clear damage and debris, but there's so many people who need so much help there that it's the best way to immerse them in the culture and it gives your trip added meaning. Uh, but the answer is there's no ethical grappling with whether or not you're going to go to Maui. Or, Mar or Morocco. It's the grappling with how and where specifically in Maui or Morocco. That's what doing your homework is all about. And in both situations, especially Hawaii, where they depend almost entirely on travel and tourism as an economic driver and a job creator, they need you right away. And believe it or not, as long as you're sensitive to that, you will not be resented for showing up. You'll be thanked. Okay? Uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, oh, from Paul, wondering what you think the most underrated European country is. Well, I've got a couple of them. One is Liechtenstein. That's right, let's all say it together. Liechtenstein. Uh, it's a postage stamp country. Uh, when I was growing up, my father was a doctor. He had a patient who traveled around the world. He knew I loved collecting stamps. And Liechtenstein was issuing a new stamp, I think, every day. It's how they derived income from stamp collectors who wanted the latest release. So I learned about countries through stamps. And Liechtenstein was like the number one <laughs> producer of them. In fact, when I went to Liechtenstein last year, and in fact, we did it as a, as a piece for The Travel Detective, which you can see on PBS or Amazon Prime. The first place I went, the post office. And would you believe they have an art museum? Because they commission these paintings. It's that cool. So something to think about. Uh, the other place that I think is underrated is Malta. Do your history. Everybody in the world came to Malta. Napoleon was in Malta. Uh, the history there is amazing. And if you happen to be in Valletta, go to St. John's Co. Cathedral. Don't just look up. Don't just look around. Look down and see what you're walking on. Talk about storytelling. That's right. You're walking on the graves of the Knights of Malta. And each grave is beautifully inlaid, either ceramic or marble, 
with the story of each of these uh, knights' exploits. Fascinating. Then the cool thing is the Caravaggio painting in that cathedral. It's got a great story. Caravaggio was wanted for murder. And so he ran to the church and sought asylum there. And the church said, we'll let you stay here as long as you paint us a painting. So he painted them the painting that's still hung up there today. And the minute the painting was done, they turned him over to the authorities. Bye bye <laughs> Great story. Anyway, uh, Dee wants to know my favorite restaurant in New York. I don't have a favorite restaurant in New York, Dee. I don't have a favorite restaurant anywhere in the world. I have favorite restaurants in New York based on type of food, right? I have favorite restaurants in Lisbon based on types of food. So uh, we'll talk about that as well. But I can't give you one. Uh, not only would it not be fair, it wouldn't be accurate. Okay, here's one from uh, Darvell, who wants to know, when should we expect the coming of the Royal Tour in Tanzania 2nd Edition? <laughs> Uh, we hope. I'll be back. I will actually be in uh, Rwanda, another place where we did a royal tour with President Paul Kagame. I'll be there uh, for the World Travel and Tourism Council coming up in early November. And the president of Tanzania is rumored to be there. So the answer to your question will be the question I ask her. And I'll let you know. Greetings from Atlanta. And Patty says the ABC Islands. By the way, you mentioned Curacao. I didn't mention Bonaire. If you're a diver, that's the place to do it. Um, do I have a favorite pl visit place in Nairobi? I do. Uh, well, you've already done Giraffe. Did you say you said Giraffe Center? Have you done Giraffe Manor? That's home run. Uh, and for those of you who are carnivores, I used to be one, but I stopped eating meat in about November of '09. But for those of you, excuse me, November of '08. But for those of you who are who are carnivores, and let's face it, I do miss eating it. Uh, there's a restaurant right near the, uh, the, uh, the Wilson Airport in Nairobi, not the international airport, but the domestic airport called Carnivore. It's like a Brazilian steakhouse, but better. So check that out. Um, okay. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm going here. Ah. Okay. Ah, Karen says Malta is the best. Yep. By the way, a lot of movies have been shot in Malta. Remember Popeye? Uh, okay. <laughs> and and Karen says Valletta is stunning and has the best swordfish ceviche. Who knew? Okay. Um, very good. Now let's continue on with a couple of housekeeping notes before I forget everything. Uh, I on travel last Saturday. We did the radio show from Bluffton, South Carolina and the Palmetto Bluff. This Saturday, it's a very good chance we're doing another city in the United States. I can't tell you which one, but let's just say their football team won last week. That's all I'm going to say. Not this weekend. They won last week. They lost this week. Um, all right. And then... Bottom line, again, if you have any questions that I haven't answered, you can always email them to me, peter at petergreenberg.com. We'll answer them either here or on our radio show, which airs every Saturday. It's called Ion Travel, three hours from a different location somewhere in the world every single week. So I hope you'll do that. And again, we answer questions on that show as well. I'm leaving now to go to the airport, but I'll see you next week at the usual time. Not the usual place, because there are no usual places. Let me just double check one more thing to see. I haven't, I haven't forgotten anybody. Uh, I haven't. I think we got everybody. Let me just double check here so I don't leave anybody hanging. Um, okay. Ontario, Canada is saying hi. Uh, oh, Darvell wants to know, can I share your view regarding Israel-Palestine war? We don't have enough time for that view, but I will say this. There are no winners here. There are only losers here. Uh, in some cases, the prisoners have become the guards. Um, Hamas does not represent the Palestinians, but they use the Palestinians. The people who get aced all the time are the Palestinians. Um, and we should never forget that. Uh, hopefully, and I don't want to get to too much politics here because that's always the, the third rail. My last name is Greenberg, so some of the things I'm going to say Many of my Jewish friends might not agree with, but 
I spent a considerable amount of time in the Middle East. As you know, I did both the royal tour of Jordan and the royal tour of Israel. With Jordan, it was the king of Jordan, and with Israel, it was with Benjamin Netanyahu. And I will tell you this. The solution here, no matter how they come up with it, is not going to be military. It's not going to be religious. It's not going to be political. It's not going to be geographical. It's going to be economical. It's going to be the economics of it. You need to give the Palestinians hope. You need to give them something they can covet and pass down to their children so that you end this cycle of hopelessness that possesses somebody to strap on dynamite and blow up buses, that possesses somebody to take up arms and just want to kill every Jew they can find. We are in a very bad place right now. The ends do not justify the means. I hope that someone, even if it's Qatar, can broker a peace, but it has to be a real peace with real value. And I'll say this, I know this is the third rail, real recognition. Um, and I say this with my last name being Greenberg. I'm open to discussion, which we could have next week because this story is not going away anytime soon. But I also say this from, from a position of portfolio. I have spent more time in the West Bank and in Gaza than I've spent in New Jersey. Uh, that's another story of occupation. No, just kidding. Uh, I've also spent more time in Israel than most people spend on vacation anywhere else because I'm there working as a journalist. I have seen not just both sides, I've seen all sides. And I can tell you, this is a terrible day in history. It's a terrible moment in history. Uh, it's barbaric. I'm not defending it in the least. There is no defense for this at all. But if, if we're gonna move forward, we have to understand it, explain it, and make sure it never happens again without excessive retribution, but reconciliation and forgiveness so that we can actually give people a life, a life that they all deserve to have. It's basically human rights time, guys. And uh, once you have that, it's amazing. I mean, I'll give you the segue. It's amazing how travel and tourism then fills that void and lifts up everybody. It's true because it's not political. Travel and tourism crosses every de demographic. It crosses every politician. There are people on the extreme right and people on the extreme left who appreciate art. There are people on the extreme right and people on the extreme left who appreciate history and culture and music and food. It's what, it's what brings us together. Now, I'm not going to sing Kumbaya way too early for that. But I'm raising a point that there are points of common ground here. We need to find them. We need to find them quickly. And then we need to enforce them. We can't continue to play to our individual bases. It never has worked before and it will never work ever. So that's my, you asked me the question, that's my answer. And uh, I'll see you next week, everybody. Let's hope for peace. Bye-bye, everybody.